Ask people in the pub their opinion on crop circles and you'll get a range of answers. The film you're about to see is a result of an objective approach to lift the lid on the real causes behind the crop circle phenomenon. I started by looking at crop circle researchers' efforts so far, and I have to say I was not impressed by most of them. Many are not scientifically qualified, they make far-fetched assumptions and use language which is ambiguous at best and meaningless at worst. They provide pseudo-explanations of how circles are formed, but clearly have no true understanding of what is going on. Some researchers, however, are more objective in their approach. Robert Hulse and David Caton have been investigating crop circles since the mid-1990s and are well known for their activities in gathering and analysing physical and photographic evidence. I started by asking them how far back crop circles go. Oh well, I mean, uh, uh, they've been around for hundreds of years. Um, certainly um, going back to the 17th century, uh, the mowing devil uh, woodcut uh, is an example of that. Um, but I feel that um, the um, early fairy rings, which were flattened areas of uh, grass or crop, uh, could well have been early examples of the um, crop circles that we see today. Okay, and, and these older circles that are basically recorded in history books, shall we say, that what kind of patterns are we talking about? More, more likely single, simple circles, I would say. Yeah. Becoming a bit more <coughs> up to date in the 1920s and the 1930s, and even during the war, 1940s, people in the farming industry in those days uh, remember when they were kids, they, they, they play in them, they find them re on a regular basis. So what countries are they appearing in now, um, and are there any specific areas in this country and other countries that they appear to occur in? Well, they're all over the world, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, we latterly have heard from uh, in Scandinavia, Italy, Germany, France. Canada. Canada, yes, America, quite, of quite course. Quite a few in Canada. Canada, probably good ones there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And in this country... Scotland. And in this country it appears to be focused on one particular county, am I right? In well, well yes. Wiltshire and then Hampshire second, I think, yes. in terms of numbers. But Wiltshire so, mainly. Yeah. And I think... Uh, it, it could have something to do with the um, uh, the the, um, the ley line uh, system, which mm -hmm. seems to be concentrated very much in the Wiltshire area, mm -hmm. with Stonehenge and particularly Avebury, mm -hmm. and the area around the Vale of Pusey. The Long Barrows, uh, the Stone Circles, as Robert says Avebury, yeah. and uh, the, the men have erected Silver Hill, of course, is still a mystery why mm -hmm. Silver Hill was there, yeah. is... Uh, a link with our past and maybe that's what they're trying to say we are linked to your past the people who built um, Avebury for instance built it there because they were well aware of the energy and I'm quite sure they used that energy for various purposes and possibly healing and am I right in thinking that the complexity has increased over the last kind of 10 or 15 years? Yeah, late yeah. 80s, early 90s, the change to what they call pictograms, mm -hmm. and you started getting different shapes, mm -hmm. and a number of circles linked, or oval shapes. And, and is that predominantly in, in the UK then, or has the complexity... Because yes. I did it, see one in uh, Holland initial, that was initial. a very complex yeah, shape. Yeah, but, it, the, but the, the more complex shapes um, started in the UK, mm -hmm. and then uh, appeared in, in Holland okay. uh, later, much later. My understanding is that you believe that some crop circles are man-made, whereas others are not man-made. Now, can you explain to me how you distinguish between the two? Well, just going back a place, we, we've learned along the way. I mean, we made mistakes when we first Certainly. started, and we would uh, give a crop circle the thumbs up as being the real McCoy. Mm -hmm. When looking back, we realise they weren't. And when so, you say real McCoy, well, you mean that it hasn't been constructed by man? Mechanical by means, man. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Right, okay. With the via a mechanical means. Okay, yeah, yeah carry on. So you, you, you've made a mistake. Why, yeah, why was well, that? because we were not recognising all the signs and we were yeah. new to the business. It's a learning yeah. curve yeah. and everyone wants to believe, including us, that yes. the formation <clears> we've gone into, which reminded me of a bit of a trek yeah. on foot to get to them, 
you want it to be the bee's knees. Yeah, you, you don't want to be disappointed. Yeah. You know, we didn't want to be critical. We, no, we no. wanted to find the real thing. Right, yeah. okay. And, and when you actually got down and started examining yeah. these things in detail, tell, tell me what you well, started to find. Well, first of all, as you go into the formation, you can immediately get an overall impression yes. by the general lay. Yeah. You know, either it's very, very flat or it looks a mess. The, yes, the, I mean, the genuine crop circle is almost perfect. Yeah. The lay flows like water yeah. flowing yeah. down a stream bed, you know. Okay. Um, the man-made ones, because they are mechanically stomped, most for the most part... In a half sort of pace, you get sort of bunching or layering of the crop, the seed heads. Yeah. This is the, the implement which was confiscated from the hoax. Quite a simple. And, and these, are, these are done using a plank of wood attached to some rope which yeah. somebody will... Will basically stomp out. Stomping across. board, yeah. Yes. That's yes. that's right. But okay. um, the uh, the genuine ones are so fluid. Mm -hmm. um, there are no mistakes. There are no acute changes of direction. And what about any other clues within the crop itself of boarding? Yes. Well, the, the board impacts the stems and, and damages the stems. So that's something you have to really get down hands and knees job mm -hmm. to look closely yeah. and they're not easy to see unless you know what you're looking for. We've just come in the formation and uh, disappointing immediately to find uh, evidence, physical evidence of, of mechanical damage and the lay is very unimpressive, very flat and there's bar board marks all over the place which is a terrible disappointment in view of our high hopes of moments ago and down here just as an area in the one of the spiral paths near the centre and you can see board mark, uh, board mark, board mark there and there and there You can miss them as we have done in the past I guess Yes uh, So the leading edge of the board as it strikes the, the stem it, it is, it's causing an injury to the stems and causes mm -hmm. lines of creases so if it's like a three foot board you'll find rows of stems more or less lined up mm -hmm. uh, and when you turn the stem over that doesn't occur on the opposite side. Well if we walk into this uh, small circle and come over here uh, I have a feeling that uh, I found the board marks fairly easily this time. Oops, a daisy. And here we are. If we come down here, we can uh, we can see that we have a board mark. And if we come over here, here we have another. So we have two of them fairly close together, which is how they should be. A row of what? One, two. Three, four, five, six. Okay. Nothing good. There's a typical crease there, and I'm bending it slightly. And then we come back towards the camera a little bit, and there we've peeled off the outer sheathing of the. And you can feel that with your fingernail. And then we come back even further to where the tip of the Dowsian rod's pointing. There's another one. It's again not too deep. You also can see a bend it there. You can see how the crease bends back, like you do with your finger. Yep. Finger, so it, on the other side it will be okay. You turn it, squish it round, and there's no mark on that side because as you turn it back, the, the edge of the board, the leading edge of the board, the plank has hit the crop there as it's gone down. That's right. We have, we have three on this stem here, but I've come across here a little bit further. We just rubbed the bloom off a little bit. I mean, just look at those. We've uh, one, two, three, four, five. When the crop is green, mm -hmm. When the board impacts the crop, um, the, the mark isn't immediately apparent. It takes about 12 hours or so for the chemical reaction in the plant to create a white line on the stem. So we thought we ought to prove this ourselves. Having knocked it down, mm -hmm. we'd go in to check to see how long and see if any of these marks uh, uh, appeared, mm -hmm. which they did. It they took well, nearly 20 hours, I think. Possibly, but it depends on the maturity of the crop. Yeah. If it's early in the season and there's plenty of um, yeah. sap going up through the green stems, mm -hmm. then they're as easy as pie to spot. Okay. Yeah. But later in the season, as the moisture 
comes out of the stems and they start to go that straw colour, mm -hmm. then they're very difficult and you simply have to get down on your hands and right. knees yeah. and check. Okay, and, and how many years have you gone back actually recording these board marks then? Um, since 2000, 2001? Yes, okay. yeah. Okay. So of the um, formations that you've actually examined, you know, down on your hands and knees, shall we say, how many do you find are man-made and how many are in the unexplained category then? Well, currently, <coughs> in the last year or two, I would think I haven't five, less, less than 5%, I would think, are, less than are genuine, in our opinion, which I know is... Much less. In much fact, less than 5%. In fact... In fact yeah, not news that people would want to hear. But in my opinion, so. um, I've not personally seen a genuine one since May 2005 okay. which was an oilseed rape formation mm. at uh, Golden Ball Hill mm -hmm. in May 2005. Mm. Fortunately our friend uh, Bill Betts uh, took some wonderful photographs of that formation on, on, the, on the morning yeah. that it was uh, discovered mm. and um, it's absolutely wonderful, the, the, the uh, pristine, mm -hmm. the, uh, the flower heads which are one of the first things to get damaged when you try to stomp oilseed rape, mm -hmm. are perfect, they're undamaged, mm -hmm. they're evenly spread throughout the laid crop, mm -hmm. just as they are in the standing crop. Uh, th th that simply is, an, is impossible mm -hmm. to recreate mm -hmm. with a stomping board. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I, I am certain that that small formation was genuine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. What about the Ogborn St George formation? Because that's another one that you believe that is a non-man made. Absolutely, mm -hmm. uh, certainly genuine formation. Uh, I mean yeah. the main thing about that was the, um, the way the crop had been laid. It wasn't flat to the ground, it was laid um, it was green. like the grooves of a record wasn't it uh, Dave? So yeah. a lo um, the, the, um, the top bit of lay was probably only a few inches below the general level of the crop in the field. To illustrate what Robert means by the grooves of a record, we can zoom into the circle in question. The arrow here shows where the photograph to the right was taken. From ground level we can see the disturbance has occurred just a few inches from the top of the crop, but this has a significant visual effect when viewed from above. Ask yourself, what could create this kind of effect? Certainly not a plank of wood. And the next band, slightly higher, then lower again, then higher, then lower, then higher. And so it goes on right across this circle. The effect is so delicate. Are there other pieces of evidence that might show what you refer to as a genuine crop circle? Well, uh, we have what are called blown nodes. Now, um, what happens, we believe, is that in the genuine formations, um, heat from some um, energy is brought to bear on the crop, which heats the moisture in the stems. Now, as there's more moisture in the nodal joint mm -hmm. of the stem, um, it acts like a pressure cooker and um, eventually it will uh, turn to steam inside the node and it has to go somewhere so it will explode a hole through the side of the nodal joint. Mm -hmm. I mean the node provides the structural strength to hold the stem vertical to take the weight of the developing seed head to stop it toppling over so that's that's the strongest part of the stem is the, is the nose that's why the space five or six up from the root mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the, that's softened, so Bartley bend it at the node right. and produce the blown node as well because of the pressure mm -hmm. yeah. built in, like a pressure Qu cooker. In a quite simply, cooker. if you went to bend a stem of wheat, yeah. it would bend on the stem between the nodes. Yes, the right. straight portion. Uh, it certainly wouldn't bend at the node. And I took some specimens to a botanist at Manchester University, a fellow called Dr Roland Enos, mm -hmm. and he had a programme going, funded by... Uh, industry, the farming industry, or the Ministry of Ag, as mm. it was, to test. And they were looking at lodging, which is a term used when the weather knocks crop down, which causes a lot of wastage to the farmer. And he couldn't understand how on earth they could be bent at the node, other than phototropism, as Robert just mentioned, mm. as a natural force going to the light, mm. horizontal yeah, okay. and down. So you think it's 
two, two different effects. One is that it's something is heating the water up inside the node sure does, to yeah. soften the plant. Yeah. Yes. And then another effect which is a mechanical or results in a mechanical effect of, of forcing the crop down mm. in a particular direction. Exactly. Another researcher who believes there are at least two effects being brought to bear in the formation of genuine crop circles is aerospace engineer Roy Dutton. And you visited many of these crop circle sites and scratched your head and thought about it and you thought, well, what could be causing this? I mean, I was particularly interested in the way that you analysed the lay of the crop. Could you tell us about that? First of all, I had to satisfy myself that what was producing the, the spirals mm -hmm. was not a plank, you know, yeah. or a roll or anything like that. Yeah. But these plants were genuinely bent mm -hmm. without breakage. Okay. and beautifully uh, inscribed into the crop. Okay. And Busty Taylor and Colin Andrews provided me with data, mm -hmm. uh, photographs and drawings of uh, draw, uh, drawings from Colin Andrews, mm -hmm. measured drawings showing how the, f the plant was swelled. Mm -hmm. And uh, also from Busty Taylor, some very good overhead mm -hmm. shots of small grape shot circles. Mm -hmm. And they say they're called grape shot, of course, because they tend to be scattered around yeah. mm -hmm. some of the bigger formations. Mm -hmm. I then began to look to see what uh, pattern, mm -hmm. what mathematical relationship could be applied to these things, mm -hmm. which might explain how they're produced. Because when you looked at that pattern, you saw that it was made up of a series of discrete actual sweeps, right. if you like. That yeah, right? that's the right. That's that's the first clue. They were generally um, uh, stripped. They were strips of okay. spiral. They were spiral strips. Spiral strips. So yes. a sequence of spiral strips throughout a three hundred and sixty degree. Right. And can yes. you? Because I know that you you made a model, and we will take a look at that, uh, which actually demonstrates uh, what the theory that you came up with that it was a a line scanner. One can split up the analysis of a swirl pattern, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, we can analyse a swirl pattern mm -hmm. by looking to see what the relative vector is mm -hmm. uh, outwards and, uh, and transversely, okay. uh, rotationally. Yeah. It looked as if they'd been formed by uh, something going out or outwards from the centre of the, mm -hmm. the formation at a steady speed. Mm -hmm while something else was was going round rotating at or it was fixed going rate. at a, at an increasing rate as you went further out, like oh, on a roundabout. You okay. see? I produced this model to demonstrate to audiences the principles involved. This little arm here with the brush on the end, in fact is free only to move radially outwards. And it flips back to the middle and then begins to move radially outwards again in a straight line. But as this is happening, the uh, whole assembly is rotating steadily in one direction or the other. It could be uh, clockwise or anticlockwise. So that the, the path travelled by the brush is a spiral path, a curled path. Now I'm going to try to demonstrate how the circle is produced in this way. Notice that the gaps are being filled in on each successive rotation until the entire circle is created. The actual shape of the spiral depends on the relative rate of outward sweep and rotation. These, this is a very short spiral but sometimes they can go all the way around. You thought it was moving at fixed velocity from the centre to the edge mm. at, this, at, at, at a fixed rotational speed. Mm. And okay. then flipping back again. And then once it got to the edge, it instantaneously would go to the centre and yeah, then start, and start, a, start a second swirl. A whole series of strips right. all round 
and to and then going around again very yeah. rapidly to fill in the gaps. Right. Okay. And you actually so modelled that on a, on a computer. I, didn't you? I modelled that on a computer, and I also uh, tried to demonstrate it with that little model of mine. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what the, mm -hmm. the actual speeds were; mm -hmm. it could produce any kind of um, spiral mm -hmm. with that form. Mm -hmm. Because believe me, you can get spirals of other forms, and I did try this with other other equations. Mm -hmm. Colin Andrews sent these drawings to me, probably because he felt they would defy all my efforts to explain them in simple terms. After about two months of frustration with this problem, the answer came to me very, very quickly. The different bands of alternating swirl directions were merely indicating that the projector beam had been operated in several different modes to produce annular rings. In fact, soon after receiving these diagrams, I was able to modify my program to incorporate that feature very successfully. The big problem was presented by that unevenly segmented annulus. Well, suddenly, the penny dropped, as they say. The flattening had begun at position one with the progressive clockwise flattening. This had continued until a 72 degree segment had been covered. At that point in the proceedings, the beam had then flipped backwards to 144 degrees to commence clockwise flattening in the direction as before. However, while the clockwise flattening had been occurring, the virtual center of the, of the disturbance had moved from one to two. The annulus had been steadily precessing anti-clockwise following this small circle shown here. So when the flip back to position two had occurred, the center was then at position two here on the precession path. In all, this process had occurred five times to form the segmented circle or annulus that we see here. Now that little precession path circle had a diameter of eight feet, which shows how large this formation really was. For me, this was undeniable proof that an advanced piece of scanning technology was being employed to produce those wonderful patterns. This is suggestive then that, that, that whatever the technology is being used is being generated from at some certain height above the crop circle. And were mm -hmm. you able to do any analysis to determine how high? No, because all I could say was that whatever it was that generated these things, it would have to be at a sufficient altitude so that to allow the beam to come down virtually, right. uh, vertically. Right, okay. yeah. The only thing that could create the flattening of the crops, which d didn't damage it, and, and produce the heating sufficiently in the, uh, in the stems to cause the, um, the distortion of the stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, I, the only, this was obviously energy which uh, you had a mechanical property, not just an electromagnetic one. Right. It wasn't just microwave energy, it was something which also could push the crop in the direction of the beam mm -hmm. motion. Let's just say then, if we, if we have a craft which has got a huge, great big, just a long metal rod, two feet wide, on a pivot, and, 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 and a machine that works in exactly the same way that your machine works on a much mm -hmm. larger scale, mm -hmm. right? It could, and, and if it was high enough in the sky, it would, it would produce that crop circle in exactly the same manner. It now, could, yeah. the only difference being, it's not a physical metal rod which has been used to it's flatten not, the crop. Because no, no. there was another case where there was no crop circle produced, but a farmer witnessed um, yeah. two feet wide black uh, tubes. Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Ball. Uh, mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. And he told us about this, this event that occurred the year before. It was overcast, no sunshine, sort of a dull-ish sort of day. It's this field here, it was in winter barley at the time, it's a cornfield most of the time, and looking across diagonally, looking at the wood behind, it was to the left, about halfway along the wood line that you can probably see mm -hmm. on the film, the first one where I stood in the field nearby, and this, then when that died away, the second one appeared near the tree, over near the oh, woods, in the, yeah, yeah, in the yeah, far yeah. distance. And uh, suddenly, in front of me was a tube running up about a thousand feet. Oh, well, I'm not a good judge, but I would say a thousand feet plus, or coming down out of sight onto the ground. This was not very many yards away from me, 
but the important point about it that struck me with it was the circular motion of the ashes in the grit on the ground. It didn't appear to be being sucked up the tube, it was just rotating at a high speed on the ground, about two feet wide, two feet six perhaps on the ground, and the, and the tube was vertical and perpendicular, and it didn't grow at the top or anything, and that was unusual, that was one of the unusual things about it, and this went on for several minutes, and then this died away, and then another one appeared about 200 yards from me then, in the other corner of the field. And this was a similar situation, again, lasting about the same time. I've worked these fields for 50 years, and uh, I've never seen anything like it before, nothing, nothing at all like it. Uh, this is a diary of 1990, the year that we saw those tubes we were describing in the field. And just to show you, the, the entry was made at the time, as shown here. And it occurred to me that he could have witnessed the kind of beam that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That this was, yeah. this was the uh, kind of energy that might be used for crop right. formation. But he was watching, he was looking at it in a, with the beam unfocused. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if it be, perhaps if it had been focused yeah. at the bottom like that, it might have actually pushed the crop down. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. the same kind of thing, energy. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to conceive that if it could do that, mm -hmm. and it was then made um, divergent at the bottom, mm -hmm. that it could lift things up. The only kind of energy mm -hmm. I could think of might be microwave or, or high frequency gravitational radiation, mm -hmm. which would have that effect of actually distorting the. Uh, the plant okay. Okay. And, and pushing it down in that way. Now that was just a wild guess, but it, then actually it is possible that that was, that is the sort mm -hmm. of energy that's being used. Mm -hmm. And if that energy is focused in some way, mm -hmm. um, then that will determine the size of the strip. Mm -hmm. The width of the strip. The width of the strip, yeah. yes. So it seems to me, if someone's got that, uh, that kind of technology, mm -hmm. It would be the simplest thing in the world, I think, for them to link the computer graphic system mm -hmm. up to the projectors, mm -hmm. it might be more than one projector I need, mm -hmm. and create any picture they like yeah. in the crop. Yeah. It didn't have to be spiral circles, yeah. it could be programmed to yeah. flatten the crop in, any, you know, in straight lines. Yeah. And yeah. Well, it's like your television set. If you think of a black and white television, You've really, you, there's only one dot making every single mm. making the entire picture, mm. and the dot's either on or off, or and it's and it's being scanned across. So if you have a scanning something that can affect or not affect, you know the the lay of the crop, and I guess you could build up any picture you like. Yeah. What I am going to ask you to do is, and I want you to put them into two different categories, <laughs> okay. uh, man-made and not man-made, and then perhaps we can spot a pattern by looking at the patterns yes. within them. The following crop circles have been found by Robert and David to contain board marks and are therefore all man-made. next group are believed to be non-man-made or genuine. You're not sure about the Galaxy one, are you? Is well, that... I, I mean, I am sure about the Galaxy yeah. one. Right. Uh, the Milk Hill uh, yeah. formation from 2001. Uh, was it August mm. 2001? Yeah. And, and what, what, what are your conclusions on that? It's absolutely genuine, right. without any question at all. So are we saying that you think the more complex ones are more likely to be man-made? Is that what you, you think? Generally oh. speaking, generally speaking. In our experience, the genuine ones have had a 
a more organic sort of quality to the design, whereas the man-made ones uh, seem to be more, um, you know, arithmetical and, right, yes. uh, you, you know, yes. the kind of thing you would design on a, a draftsman's yeah. table. Cute, cute, cute lines and also the fiddly bits. Yeah. Uh, the the, the yeah. favourite thing in the last years is to put little nests in, uh, crowns, almost like wedding cake effects, mm -hmm. twist the uh, stuff round, do a bit of handwork, and it's done by hand mostly. Yeah. And people are blown away by that and think, whoa, this is something special. Look at yeah. all these intricate designs within the design. Uh, the, the Mayan Aztec kind of designs, as far as I'm concerned, they're all man-made. Yeah. They're all tapping into this uh, 2012 mm -hmm. event. They cunningly yeah. design topical themes and, and things to do with eclipses, you know, astronomy or whatever's yeah. going on in the sky, in the heavens, they pick up on and translate mm -hmm. to the shape of the formation on the ground, mm -hmm. knowing that people will warm to that theme mm -hmm. and think themselves very clever to pick up on these links and then go on conference platforms mm -hmm. eulogising about the, the crop circle and talking about these connections yeah. you know, yeah. and making a bit of money on the way as well. Yeah. When collecting evidence at the scene of a new crop circle, David Caton often takes radiation readings. He has found that the formations which he believes to be man-made produce nothing more than background radiation. However, on two separate occasions, David has measured effects on his Geiger counter in non-man-made circles. In this case, David's meter reads 18 times higher than the normal background level. David telephoned the National Radiological Board headquarters from the crop circle and spoke to an instrumentation expert. He believes that the effect on the meter was not caused by dangerous particle or ionizing radiation and the cause was probably electromagnetic in nature, although one cannot conclude where the source of this energy is. In the 1980s, at a time before complex man-made circles were being produced, an independent research group was set up called the CCCS, the Centre for Crop Circle Studies. Originally headed by scientist Professor Archie Roy, its goal was to find out the cause behind the crop circles. At its peak, the CCCS had over 1,000 members, but during the 1990s, membership dwindled due to the disillusionment felt by members who found more and more man-made formations. It eventually ceased carrying out research in 2005 with no firm conclusions. And what about government involvement in crop circles? According to Nick Pope, the Ministry of Defence's first involvement with crop circles was in 1985, when the army investigated a crop circle reported to them by a farmer. A few years later, in the late 1980s, the government organisation ADAS was given some crop circle samples by the CCCS. An analysis was carried out at a government lab in Wolverhampton. They were passed some samples from the CCCS of soil and stems to analyse. And uh, they got virtually the same results as Dr Bill Le Levengood did in America. Okay. Mm. And they put some reports out on the media. And, uh... But once the story got out that government was spending taxpayers' money on such research, questions were asked in Parliament in the summer of 1989. Sort of challenging the Speaker in the House, why were ADAS wasting time and public money mm -hmm. looking at silly crop circles, was the term used. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two scientists from the Wolverhampton laboratories where they worked were shortly afterwards made redundant, okay. mm. sacked or whatever. Mm. And my belief is that was a, a um, there were sort of uh, scapegoats, scapegoats to, to, to stop <coughs> other government agencies and laboratories getting involved with this okay. seriously. Mm. The following summer in 1990, a three week project. Project Blackbird was embarked upon by crop circle researchers Colin Andrews and Pat Delgado, BBC Television, Nippon Television and the Ministry of Defence to try and solve the mystery once and for all. And Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister at the time and uh, in the early 90s when these pictograms started to appear mm -hmm. she asked questions apparently in her cabinet what is going on 
Yes. And she authorised the army to go into the fields, and I think it was a three-week exercise. This was all before my term, actually. Mm -hmm. But people like Colin Andrews was involved, and Roy Dutton physically. Yeah. And they set up a, an operation which was called Operation Blackbird. Andrews appeared on TV each day as the results from their night vigils transpired. On day two, a crop circle appeared, and Andrews gave a television interview showing great enthusiasm only to be made to look foolish some time later when it was revealed that it was a hoax. Looking back on this project today, it seems likely that Colin Andrews was set up by certain people within the government as a deliberate attempt to show to the public that the phenomenon was not real. Unbeknown to everyone, at the same time, the army were in fact carrying out a separate secret project 19 miles away at Silbury Hill. It seems Project Blackbird had two hidden agendas. Firstly, to debunk the world's leading crop circle researchers, and secondly, to divert media and public attention away from the secret Army Crop Circle Surveillance Project at Silbury Hill. This event marks the last known government involvement with crop circles, or at least that has been admitted to. After this date, many believe that the issue was taken out of the hands of visible government and investigation allowed to continue in the hands of British and American intelligence. The government, the, mil the military, know full well that this is a real and important phenomenon mm -hmm. and uh, they, they, weren't, um, they weren't wasting their time. They were investigating something extremely important mm -hmm. and they're still doing it today. Mm -hmm. Military helicopters and on some occasions AWACS aircraft are sometimes witnessed by crop circle onlookers, seemingly analysing the crop circle areas. I mean, we've filmed um, Apache attack helicopters hovering low over the east field mm -hmm. in the Vale of Pusey. If, 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 an, if a politician was to stand up in Parliament now and say, are we spending any government funds on this phenomena? you think the answer would be emphatically no, then? They oh, have, they, oh they would deny it, I'm they sure. They would deny it, but <coughs> the helicopters are all over the place. They're well, there, so. all the time. Some have witnessed these military helicopters chasing small, glowing balls of light above the crop circles. Without any doubt, the balls of light are a real phenomena. Okay. Definitely. In fact, the, by the East Field, we have Golden Ball Hill, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. has been called Golden Ball Hill for mm -hmm. probably centuries. Mm -hmm. The reason being, uh, golden balls of light have been seen there yeah, for yeah, so yeah. long. The, the military and uh, our government mm -hmm. have known about the, um, th the real mm -hmm. phenomenon for many, many years. Right. And there's mm -hmm. probably a need-to-know basis going on right. here as well. Okay. Now we'll come back. I felt I had to get to the bottom of the complex man-made crop circles in order to fully understand what is going on. Okay, now tell me about the Doug and Dave characters because they are often cited as being responsible for a lot of a lot of crop circles. Prominent in the early nineties and late nineteen eighties. Am I right there, yeah. Dave? Uh, Nineteen ninety one and so, so tell me about about those two guys because they were they were a lot of the circles at that time were put down to these two guys. Yeah, yeah Doug, so. Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they, they were roped in. Forgive me the pun. Right. <laughs> well, I think by had used set up and encouraged mm -hmm. because I think in those days John Lumberg and his team weren't producing so many they were, it was in their early days okay, so, so John Lumberg um, he, he's responsible and admits to being responsible for some of the very complex formations and he even has a website which promotes that yeah. circlemakers.org absolutely okay. and, it's, and it's a good website to have a look at because people can really see how these complicated formations are created mm. because that's a problem people have they see these wonderful aerial shots and they think how can that possibly have been made by people with planks well mm. if you go on the site he'll show you how mm. how they're made i mean that was our initial reaction <clears throat> when you see these fantastic formations it's this thing how can you do this in the dark mm -hmm. in, in a field in a few hours of darkness and in the summertime you only get a certain amount of darkness. But in our opinion, the, the whole Circle Makers website and Lumberg and co are all part of a disinformation mm. campaign. Yeah. Originally, we 
feel, possibly funded by government. Yeah. There was certainly a, um, a link on the Circle Makers website, which was a recruiting banner, which took you straight to um, a government um, um, recruitment for MI5. Mm -hmm. um, we do believe that the genuine crop circles are extremely important and that government has known this for a long time. Mm. And that is why teams, well, that particular team, the Lumberg team, Team Satan, it as it originally was called, mm -hmm. um, I believe were inaugurated mm -hmm. in order to throw sand in the eyes of researchers mm -hmm. so that um, they wouldn't be able to see easily Mm -hmm. uh, which were genuine and which weren't. So let's just take a close look at John Lundberg, who is the alleged ringleader of the organisation creating the complex crop circles throughout the 1990s and up to the present day. After leaving school, Lundberg studied fine art at Middlesex University. Then, in 1992, did a Masters in Sculpture at the Slade School of Fine Art in central London. At this time, literally next door to his art school, was the anonymous headquarters of MI5. It housed the Director General and some of the most top secret and controversial of MI5's active service units. Lumberg's final year at university was spent studying next door to this secret office. It's well known that intelligence agencies often recruit agents in their final year of university. So when did Lundberg actually start making crop circles? On his own website he claims he started in the early 90s, which presumably means after he finished art school in 1992. Wikipedia discusses a crop circle he made in 1993, so it would seem 92 or 93 is the year he started. In other words, shortly after leaving Slate Art College, which was next door to MI5. Considering some of the actual crop circle designs themselves, I personally do not think these circles have been designed by the mind of an artist. This example shows the number pi encoded in degrees of arc around a circle to nine decimal places. This has been designed by a mathematical mind, not an artistic mind. That is not to say that Lundberg and his team do not implement these patterns, just that it is unlikely they have designed them. Robert Hulse and David Caton allege that advertisements for jobs in MI5 have been placed on the Circle Makers website. These adverts no longer exist, but there are other references to MI5. After logging onto the site, if one clicks View Source to view the HTML code behind the website, we can view the keywords which the person designing the site has assigned to the site. The second keyword is MI5. Other keywords include British Security Service, Spy, Intelligence, CIA, Espionage and Terrorism. Further references to MI5 can be found in the text itself. Here Lundberg teases Colin Andrews about funding and I quote, Well, it looks like veteran crop circle researcher Colin Andrews might be forced to get a real job. He's posted an urgent appeal for funds on his website. If all else fails, Colin could join MI5 PSYOPs department and retrain as a crop circle maker. Now, you might think these references are just too blatant, but I believe there is a degree of double bluffing going on here. Another fact I found peculiar about the website is its hosting arrangement. The Circle Makers site is hosted in Pittsburgh in the United States. It's fairly unusual for British organisations to host their sites in America. I checked the Whois register, which is the internet register of domain names, to see if there was any useful information. As expected, Lundberg is listed as the owner. The administrative contact, however, is listed as John Kurzak from Michigan, along with his phone number. I telephoned the number, but that number is no longer assigned to a John Kurzak. He has presumably moved on from the Michigan address. I searched for John Kurzak in the American White Pages. Kurzak is quite a rare name, and I found there was only one John Kurzak in the whole of America. Kurzak is a 61-year-old colonel in the United States Air Force, still in active service at Randolph Air Base in San Antonio, Texas. 
I telephoned Kurzak and asked him about the Circle Maker's domain name. He seemed genuinely to have no knowledge of the site. It is my belief that Kurzak himself did not register his own name because the surname listed in the Whois database is spelt incorrectly. It has been spelt with a C. An easy mistake to make with this name, but not if it is your name. This suggests to me that somebody was just using his name. An administrator name was probably required when purchasing the domain name. The US Air Force connection is very intriguing. In 1995, when the Circle Maker's site was set up, Kurzak took a military commission, tying him more closely to the Air Force. Perhaps it's a big leap of assumption, but in the town where Kurzak works, there is another US Air Base called Lackland Air Base, which just so happens to be the headquarters of the US Air Force Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Agency. At this base, there are 1,000 technical personnel involved in a range of activities. It's a big leap, but perhaps this is where the crop circles are designed. And what about financial arrangements? If the circle makers have spent the last 17 years flattening crop fields, how have they managed to earn a living? What are their business activities? I searched the online CreditSafe database which lists directors of all UK companies past and present. I found that in September 99 Lundberg set up three companies. These were called Developmental, whose activity is listed as other computer related activities, Vagrant listed as other business and Stimulant listed as other business. Stimulant Limited did not trade and was dissolved some time later. Lumberg's partner in these businesses was Matt Glubb, a talented web designer whose role was probably to work on the Circle Maker's website. From the figures available, both of these companies had minimal assets and cash. It is unlikely they were successful as they were both eventually dissolved. So where were they getting their funds from? An interesting quote on the Circle Maker's website alludes to the fact that Lundberg and Glubb were being funded by somebody. I quote, You'd be surprised how expensive running a successful website can be. But don't panic, we're not going to ask you for money. Our retainer from sources we'd rather not disclose has kept our virtual head above water. Consider for a moment if it is likely that a bank or investor would fund such activities. We know that Lundberg has what he calls on his website a retainer, i.e. someone, some, something is funding him. Mm -hmm. And so let's just consider that you went to someone with a business proposition and you said, right, well, I've got this great idea of making patterns in the crop. It's a great business idea. I want some funding. I want to start a website telling people how to do it. And by the way, it's... We are breaking the law every time we do it. Yes, it's um, yeah. So you go to some person, let's say one of these venture capitalists, something like that. We've got this great idea. We go out, we break the law, we, we break into farmers' fields, we flatten the crop. We've got these great designs. Can you give us a retainer to, 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 you know, to allow us to continue with our ideas? Do you, do you think that you would get a private investor that would, that would fund such an organisation? I would have no. thought so. And I can't so, see any high street bank manager giving the green light either. I say, here's a, here's a few yeah. thousand pounds, yeah. lads, you know, and get started. Yeah. Yeah. I decided to check out Lundberg's residence, which is an apartment in London. I decided to run some land registry checks on the apartment, and I came up with some bizarre findings. The block where Lundberg lives, built in 1995, contains about 40 apartments. Lundberg's apartment does not appear on the land registry database. I purchased a copy of the deeds and the land it is registered under is not the land on which it was built. There is no record of it ever being bought or sold since it was built. I telephoned the land registry to ask why this was. They said that it must never have been sold since it was built. There are three more properties neighbouring Lundberg's that have this exact same anomaly. I telephoned the housing association who were listed as the owner of these properties and asked if they had any apartments to rent in that block. They said they have four and said that the tenants in those properties were, quote, a different type of tenant to our normal tenant. I asked what they meant by this and she said, 
the rent was not paid by the tenants, they were either leased or being paid for by the council. I checked out the identities of the residents of the other three properties, and judging by what they do for a living, I would not expect them to be entitled to housing benefit. Therefore, the rents are not being paid for by the council. Could it be I have uncovered three more people who are associated with the same organisation? You can find interviews featuring John Lumberg on the internet in which he regularly states the following. Unlike most other artists, our work relies on the fact that the work we create needs to be authorless to function properly. This is the polar opposite to how we usually think about art. We call works by their author, it's a Warhol, a Dali, a Picasso. But for our work to function properly, we need to totally remove ourselves from the equation. Crop circles gain their power from the gap in knowledge about their author. As soon as you claim authorship of a crop circle, you drain it from the very thing that gives it its power, its mystery, and it just becomes a mere specimen, just flattened crop. Now this all sounds very nice, but to me it is an obvious tactic which has been adopted as a means to confuse the public into not knowing which circles are genuine and which ones are man-made. MI5 take great care in ensuring secrecy is maintained when recruiting their personnel. Therefore, it is not possible to obtain any concrete proof of who their agents are. I would argue that the amount of circumstantial evidence I have just presented is very compelling. In carrying out this work, I believe I now have the identities of seven MI5 agents operating in various professions, predominantly the media one of whom is a household name. For my own personal safety, this information has been shared with a number of trusted individuals who are holding the information at this time. Government realised how important these crop circles were mm -hmm. and therefore they needed somebody they could rely on to try and uh, rubbish the phenomenon. Yeah, it's probably sort of conscripted. Yeah, mm -hmm. something had to be done, I think, to put the, the thumb down on this thing and nip, right. nip it in the, uh, the bud, as you might say, before it got out of hand. And one way of nipping it in the bud is to muddy the, wa muddy the waters. Yes, yes, definitely, yes. And, and, and control the release of information. It's an old propaganda techniques. And okay. those Why would our government that we elect not want us to know the truth about the real crop circles and muddy, use our own taxpayers' money to sponsor people to, f to basically fool ourselves. What is it that we can't handle? What's going on here? What's the reason why, why people are diverting and, and confusing the issue? Or the government is... Uh, uh, the, the reason is on. very simple. <laughs> We are not alone, <laughs> and we never have been alone. <clears throat> Many people have tried to um, explain them, explain why uh, these entities are producing these circles in the in the ground. Um, there are lots of different theories, I guess. Do you have have you developed a theory on that, Roy, at all? Well, I thought I still think to some extent they're playing games with us. Right. Because they're teasing us. Whatever the true cause of the genuine crop circles, if millions of pounds of taxpayers' money is being used to sponsor the psychological manipulation of honest people, then this is a crime on the scale of Watergate. Surely we deserve better. It's my belief that MI5's role goes much further than sponsoring crop circles. I suspect they have agents in most, if not all, mainstream media organisations being used to put spin on the truth and put into people's minds what they want people to believe. This leads me to my final question. Who is really controlling the intelligence agencies? I have my own theory on this, but I will leave you to decide.
Honesty 